For weeks now, there have been reports of UFO sightings. And Flashback to the 1970s, unidentified flying objects. One newspaper put a sketch of a supposed extraterrestrial visitor on the front page. Gulfport police have received so many calls that they've posted a nighttime watch. It's what people across the country were talking about then. And in one small Kentucky town, it's what people are still talking about. Documented in the local newspapers. We want to see what people saw in 1976. Many people said they saw something one winter night in Lincoln County. But Mona Stafford is the only woman left to say she experienced it. No, it's the most scariest, terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. January 6, 1976 in Stanford. Mona Stafford was turning 36. Mona, along with Louise Smith and Elaine Thomas, planned a simple celebration. Labeled by UFO researchers as possibly the most fact-rooted abduction case on record, the incident begins here at what was once Redwood Restaurant. Everything was going on a different direction from where I started. Past 11, the birthday party was over. With Louise driving the Chevy Nova, the three women headed down Route 78, a narrow winding road under a cold, clear sky. I just seen this light coming down. An intense red glow heading toward their car, inching closer and closer, until Mona says the object stopped and hovered next to the right side of the car. She says it was a bluish white dome. I said, no step on the gas, let's get out of here. And I looked down, I said, man, you're going 85 miles an hour. She just picked her feet up and said, Mona, I'm not touching it, I'm not touching the pedal. And it's here the women say that their car finally stopped after going nearly 85 miles per hour. But the car didn't stop entirely. In fact, they say it backed up, heading towards a very dark area, an unknown farm to all three of the women. What happened after that forever is written in UFO history. It pulled us up. It just, that light just pulled us, sucked us up in it. These drawings describe what each woman says happened next. For Louise, the gray hooded masked creatures kept her arms from moving. For Elaine, her throat throbbing from something around her neck. For Mona, she lie on a table being observed. All three women say they were burned. Went to my family doctor, and that's when he, he said, yes, I've had serious radiation. Their story was the talk of the town and eventually the talk of UFO researchers. Seeking an explanation, the women decided they'd only share it with a psychologist, someone to help explain this strange event. To help unravel this mystery, the National Enquirer arranged for psychologist Leo Sprinkle to investigate the abduction story. Regressive hypnosis at the Brown Motel in Casey County took the women back to the strange darkness. A Lexington police detective gave Mona, Louise, and Elaine polygraph tests. After the session, everyone involved found the women to be truthful. It's in my eyes when I close my eyes. While the hypnosis helped the women, it did not explain why they could not fit the unexplained experience in their natural lives. Over the years, Mona Stafford wanted to talk about what happened. But Elaine and Louise didn't like to. And when they passed away, Mona was left to ponder alone. Did you see that? That light, it's blinding me. I can't see anything. 35 years later, Danville-based playwright Elizabeth Orndorff is talking about the women's story. High Strangeness is a lighthearted tale fit for an audience. We're lucky that she shared it with us instead of keeping it to herself. Mona Stafford, Louise Smith, Elaine Thomas, three ordinary women with an extraordinary experience. An experience decades later, seemingly without an answer. I know what it is, but I want, I just want to know.
Poor baby. Meet Lila, a timid 20-pound dachshund, the apple of her owner's eye. She's a good dog. She really is. But when Carol Terry leaves for any length of time, <laughs> Lila loses it, chewing anything in sight. Shoes, rugs, curtain, door casings. Because when we come home, there's just pieces of things lying around because she's tried to get out the door. Can you say major separation anxiety? We were afraid to go because we don't know what she's going to do if we leave her. Dog lovers, can you relate? If so, here's a product some pet owners swear by, the Thunder Shirt. For less than 40 bucks, it claims to calm dogs during storms, stop excessive barking, basically reduce their anxiety. Oh, I would love it if it was a miracle. I'd like to be able to get out of the house. But Lila's owner has to see it. You're just a nervous wreck. To believe it. Carol left Lila alone with our camera rolling to see how Lila behaves without the shirt. In 30 minutes, the panicky pooch paced the room, jumping on and off the couch, and yes, she did a little nibbling. Ding, ding, why did you eat the door? Next, we put Thunder shirt to the test, fitting it snug as directed, then left. Like before, Lila paced on the couch and sniffed the same spot she chewed earlier. But did it work? A half an hour later... She didn't need any wood. She still got up in the window, but she was a lot calmer. This Lexington veterinarian says the Thunder shirt is nothing to bark at. It's a security concept. It's like putting a baby and wrapping them and holding them up nice and close. It gives them that sense of security. Clay Harvey of Bluegrass Barkery says owners are eating it up. The feedback we got from the, from the general customer that, that bought the product was either it, it totally eliminated the problem or they saw such a decrease in the anxiety or the situation that they were trying to solve that they were ecstatic. As for Lila? It seems to have made a difference with her because she, there was just... Her not chewing something up while you're gone is saying a whole lot. We've all been caught in it, frustrated by it, the digging and the dumping, the noise and the shoveling. But what would you do if this construction was going on in your front yard? Pictures are falling off my walls, cups are falling out of my cabinet, but yet the state of Kentucky thinks it's okay for me to live in this house. B.J. McGee knew the new bypass was going to be built outside her front door. What she didn't expect were these dynamite blasts, how close they would be. I can't get anyone to help me. I can't even get anyone to talk to me. Aside from all of this noise and the annoyance of the construction, B.J.'s biggest concern is the safety of her kids. Why? Well, because their bedroom sits closest, about 20 feet away, to that first glass hole. We have laws that we have to follow. Yeah. As long as we stay within those laws, we're good. We're, you're totally good. So this is safe distance from the house, you're saying? Yeah. Crews say when the dynamite explodes, it doesn't affect anything above ground. You can't see it. It's a minor blast. But BJ still has questions. The question she says the state ignores. Uh, the bottom line is... I want my home destroyed before I figure out what I need to do. Covering the news in Estill County, Courtney Fisher, LEX 18 News. If there is one person who has every right to question the system, it's Lisa Carr. But she's no longer with us. What happened to her should be a big wake up call to those who decide it's okay to parole violent offenders. We're on special assignment to show you why. Like the 911 was emergency. Yes, but somebody next door is calling help call the police at 714 Aurora Avenue. There's a man with a knife attacking a woman. Inside this home, a dying Lisa Carr stabbed 13 times with this kitchen knife, names her killer before taking her last breath. What's his name? Roderick Blinko. Roderick Blinko, a career criminal cut break after break, this time busted for murder. He was stabbed in her abdomen area. She was stabbed in her back. 
She was stabbed in her neck and her throat. Roderick Blinko should have been in jail. LEX 18 discovered despite his violent past. Unlawful imprisonment, robbery first, robbery second, burglary third. He was routinely let in and out of prison's revolving door. Paroled eight times before he graduated to murder. The parole board gambled with this yard bird and Lisa Carr lost. LEX 18 found that after Blinko's eighth parole, eight months before Lisa Carr's murder, the system had at least two more chances to lock up this soon-to-be killer. He violated parole twice, but instead of going to jail the second time, Blinko went to a halfway house. It was during this time he murdered Lisa Carr. How does somebody like that get paroled? It's a question that we ask every day in this office. A question we wanted answered. In this case... This is the most egregious that I have seen of how it has affected the criminal justice system. Senator Kathy Stein wants a prosecutor and a defense attorney who says clearly there was a breakdown. I'm surprised that he was let out of uh, prison uh, for a violent offense, the robbery. Several violent offenses. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm, eight times he went before a parole board. It perplexes me as well, but I want to go look at this guy's record. Lisa Carr wasn't asking for this, but she got it because the system let her down. Roderick Blinko was sentenced to life in prison, and we'll keep an eye on Kentucky's revolving door of justice. Back to you. The earth was horribly torn to pieces. At first, the Mississippi seemed to recede from its banks. Eliza Bryan, New Madrid. Journals, books, and artwork capture the catastrophe of the 1800s. Some research suggests the Great Quake was actually a series of more than 2,000 shocks over five months, the greatest on February 7, 1812, measuring 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale. Frightening and more historic than any earthquake in the United States. Ann Copeland helps run New Madrid's History Museum. The latest addition is this new exhibit created for the 200th anniversary. We think that it just it needs to be told because people need to be aware that these things can happen. The quake rattled people as far away as New York City, rang church bells in Washington, D.C., and changed the landscape forever. Still today, sand pits are left from fractures in the earth. 200 years ago, the closest settlement to the epicenter of the great quake was here, New Madrid, Missouri, right along the Mississippi River. Now the fault line beneath this has become known as the New Madrid Fault, a fault some say could repeat history. The fault crosses Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Illinois. In 1990, researcher Ivan Browning predicted the next big one would hit on December 3rd. Schools closed, earthquake insurance policies soared, and the media descended on the town of New Madrid. Residents remember it well. About two weeks before that was supposed to happen, we had a pretty good shaker. And I thought, looky here, <laughs> maybe it is going to happen. Nothing did, and it was dubbed the Great Media Quake of 1990. It opened our eyes and told us, you're not prepared in any way. Talk and of the I next disaster hasn't stopped. Geologist Zeman Wang at the University of Kentucky says the New Madrid is capable of repeating the nightmare of 1812 but he says probably not for several more hundred years. Some say when it does happen, Memphis and St. Louis would fall. Wang says in Kentucky, Paducah would be hit worst. In Lexington, he says damage would be minor, older homes may crack, chimneys would crumble. There would be devastation. Kentucky's emergency management director, John Hetzel, says the Commonwealth regularly practices earthquake drills and encourages every family to have a survival kit. I just hope people will be prepared take care of themselves. Because many say it's not a question of if the next great quake will happen, it's when. I cannot imagine.